Hey, hello. This I think this will be my last talk on this on this uh, conference, so I have to enjoy it. <laughs> so so I'm talking here on behalf of uh, Francois Prunier uh, from uh, Titulus, who is not able to join the conference, unfortunately. Uh, Florent, who is here, who is a, a technical expert mostly on the on the client side. Uh, Antonio and uh, Juan, who is mostly uh, on the back end. So so most of the team uh, is actually here. So if you have questions, uh, go to them. So there's a typical thing with this logo. Uh, if you look at it from from this side, it will will tell you. What will it say? Good. So a GN. This is a thing that you have to see, and then you never unsee it again. There's a, there's another thing with this logo. It's it's a monk that uh, that makes a sign like this. So those are those are the IDs of the designer behind this logo. We're considering to take a new logo, <laughs> although this one is very much appreciated. But we're still thinking about that. So. A uh, very short table of contents. Uh, what's happening in Geo Network? I'm going to throw a lot of topics on you. I probably don't have enough time to speak about everyone in detail, but then we can have in the Q&A section uh, more uh, time to discuss it. Um, so short for those who are not, who's not aware of Geo Network? Ah, so, so I can do this really fast. Um, Geo Network, this is a website. It's a catalog, uh, free and open source OSG project. Founder is Jeroen Tichler, our boss, uh, at, uh, back then in the FAO. Uh, it's adopted in numerous uh, spatial data infrastructures and is uh, uh, Inspire ready. And it, it has a growing community of users and developers, of which you probably are uh, some. Um, so we share. Uh, it's not handy that I'm looking like this <laughs> because I wanted to talk to you. Probably I'm going to stand here anyway. So the catalog is a way to share and organize the, 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 the spatial resources. And uh, it has a huge uh, variety of metadata standards, which makes it kind of stand out between other catalogs. Um, this is our uh, OSGO uh, website. So we are an OSGO project since long. Um, so that was the introduction to Geo Network. It was pretty fast. So what's happening in the, in the community? Um, every year we have the Bolsena Code Sprint. I think we're on number 12 this year. So, so we always invite all the OSGO projects there, but in practice it was, it's mostly the, the Geo Network community uh, joining up there. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely Code Sprint in a lovely Italian uh, monastery. So it's really, uh, please join. For example, this year we discussed with the, with the terrestrial people uh, the geospatialer format that we discussed in uh, some of the other uh, uh, talks. Uh, currently running is the OSGO uh, Google Docs project, and uh, for for GeoNetwork community that's that's pulled by by Joe from Aston. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing as, uh, effort from her. So she's setting up teams, uh, engaging people we never met before, and uh, doing all kinds of, of uh, documentation efforts. That, that's, a, that's a great uh, value. Um, first results should come in the upcoming OSGO Live. Uh, there was a recently an Elastic Sprint, which was actually the, at the second or third uh, already, uh, where we are introducing uh, um, the current search index uh, for Elastic. Um, Elasticsearch uh, should uh, improve the performance on, on the larger catalogs and uh, the, most importantly it will allow for clustering because that's, that's currently one of the big limitations of GeoNetwork that uh, it's hard to cluster. It's possible, we have some implementations but it, it's, it's not for the average user but uh, Elasticsearch will, will enable that. Um, also Sometimes we have uh, limitations in the current search, which would be really hard uh, to implement in Lucene. 
So uh, with Elastic, we will get that as a bonus. So what, what the time frame will be is a bit uncertain because it's a huge effort and, and we're actually still looking for funding on that, on that effort. Um, but we hope that it will be next summer. Looking a bit to Florent, but he's, he's not nodding yes or no, so <laughs> we don't know. Um, so uh, this is a thing I wanted to put in between. As, as GeoCAD, Geo we, we currently offer a, a GeoNetwork Enterprise, which is a, a commercial off-the-shelf product, um, uh, which is uh, the same code, so it has the same GPL2 license. However, uh, we, uh, we release it a bit later than the community edition, and we offer longer support on that. So, so you have a three to five years uh, support on that version. Uh, this one can also be ordered as a hosted uh, solution. So you have a kind of a uh, one-click environment, which is called GeoCat Live. More on that on our booth. So uh, this is a, an interesting development. So the Flemish government uh, developed a, a GeoDCAT app plugin. That's, so that's a, a DCAT is a, is a format that is used in the open data community uh, a lot. However, it's, it's a kind of a challenge for GeoNetwork because it's an RDF format. And uh, um, GeoNetwork is an XML-oriented uh, uh, product. And uh, there is an, an XML encoding of RDF, but uh, um, for example, that doesn't have order, where our XML world requires order in XML um, in, the, the, in the properties. So import, in creating GeoDCAD app is, is quite simple in GeoNetwork. However, importing it as a JSON-LD or Turtle is, is kind of hard. So, that, so we kind of made an intermediate wrapper that uh, first converts uh, the, the RDF object into uh, uh, an XML object having a certain order. So GeoNetwork is able to ingest that. Um, GDPR, the, the privacy regulation of the European Union, uh, even outside Europe, you must have heard about it. Um, one of, uh, it's huge impact on all of IT. Uh, one of the uh, mandates in that regulation was that, uh, that organizations have to set up a, a registry of uh, uh, data provenance. And, uh, well, a logical choice would be to put that in, a, in an existing registry in your organization, and the Geo Network could be one of those. So we worked with the Dutch National Health Institute uh, to create a, a GDPR profile for Geo Network. Um, the GDPR model is quite, quite similar. Uh, there's things like title, author, that, that type of things. But there's a couple of things that uh, do not fit in the ISO model. So we needed to create an, an extension on top of the ISO model. So we extended the, the schema. But it has a, so it was an amazing experience with those guys because also after, when we started implementing that, there was kind of also a return because their, their catalog was uh, growing considerably due to the effort. And they had to go to all the departments to, to explain about GDPR and, and their catalog. So uh, um, also, the efforts from them, from the geo department, were much clearer in the organization. So that was really a nice uh, thing happening in parallel. Um, we're currently investigating with a couple of our, our customers a lightweight Inspire harmonization. Um, I've presented a, a couple of times on, the, on this topic on the Inspire conference, but. Um, we see, in, uh, so, you know, for, for those not here in Europe, uh, organizations uh, related to environment have to uh, comply to certain data models uh, for their data. And what we see is that, that uh, people do that conversion to that European data model at the end of the pipeline. So they work with their own models, and then when all is done, they do the conversion to the Inspire model. And uh, this is, goes a bit against open data principles because you have to provide your data as primary and complete as possible. 
So that's why we're, we're looking for alternative for this uh, harmonization process. And one of the things that we have, uh, well, let me first do this, this rule of thumb. So I always challenge organizations saying, okay, so you did this uh, nice uh, uh, transformation process, but now if I give you the Inspire data set of your neighboring municipality, will you be able to ingest that, go the other way, and, and put it next to your own data and use it in workflows? And uh, people then have to say, ooh, ooh I don't know about that. So um, our strongest advice, the first advice we give is publish the, the Inspire data in, in, in that transformed uh, format, but also publish the original as-is data. So people are always possible to go back to the originals. <coughs> but besides that, we're, we're suggesting a, uh, an RDF a type of approach where you tag your columns using the Inspire ontology without touching the data and let uh, the consumers of the data do the actual harmonization step. So, so and, and we're doing that based on the ISO 19110 feature catalog uh, standard. So another thing, the schema.org, uh, uh, the, the, the data crawlers. So we had a, a, an interesting workshop at the JRC uh, two months ago about uh, catalogs and, and uh, search engines. And uh, somebody from the U UK uh, Geospatial Commission uh, presented that, that their research that, uh, that found out that 75% of the traffic to the catalog actually came from the search engine. So if you want to promote uh, data and your catalog, you have to make sure that your catalog is uh, harvested by the search engines. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a continuous effort uh, to, to, uh, to uh, work on, uh, on search engine optimization for your catalog. So in GeoNetwork 3.0, we added uh, the, the capability to be crawled. Um, but problems with spidering continued up to 361, which never released, but you, can, you, you could install it from Git. Um, and that was partially related to the fact that there was low interest from, from users as well as developers for this aspect. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a shame. Um, this, is, this is one of the tools that you can use to, to evaluate uh, the, this, the crawling beha behavior of your catalog. This is, uh, the, in this case, the Google uh, Search Console that gives you an indication of the coverage of your catalog, how many records in your catalog are actually uh, crawled by the spider. And uh, this, this red line here is quite uh, flat because this is not um, GeoNetwork, but PyGeo API. So I, I'm taking, <laughs> and PyGeo API does not have any errors. Usually in metadata, you see a lot of errors, like metadata or links in the metadata being invalid, and then you see uh, errors coming here. Um, schema.org. Uh, schema.org is a, is, a, is, a, is a way to annotate your websites. So in search engines, so it's not just Google, that, that's all the Bing, Yandex is a, is a wider initiative, is able to uh, extract structured content uh, from that page, for example, addresses or opening hours of a shop. But they also have a schema.org dataset initiative. So if your website exposes uh, information about a data set and you tag it with this schema org data set annotations, the search engine will be able to, to um, know that you're describing a data set. Um, so we uh, always had the schema.org uh, support um, uh, as make microdata. Microdata is, is kind of a HTML way to do it. Uh, however, this was replaced in 3.8 with a JSON-LD uh, type of approach. So we embed uh, the JSON-LD into the HTML, and that's a, it's a bit more cleaner approach and was easier for us to, uh, to manage because uh, schema.org has appeared to be quite fragile over time. Um, so if you have those, those tags, then, then there's this initiative Google Dataset Search that is able to uh, find uh, those datasets coming from the catalog. So, What's new in 3.8? 3.8 was actually launched uh, last Monday, so we actually it was mostly Francois doing a lot of effort to finish it before this uh, this conference, and it worked. I hope. 
the, there's not still too many uh, blocking issues open <laughs> that you're now confronted with. Else, I'll, I'll suggest you wait till 381. <laughs> but um, it looks quite similar as 36. Not not much changes on that uh, side. Um, but what is an improv imp uh, important improvement is the workflow uh, and draft. Uh, so uh, Antonio gave a presentation on this topic uh, this morning. So we have a, uh, you can now have a, see a history of the of the, all the edits and, uh, and updates on your record and, and even jump back to a record in history if if you're not happy with recent uh, edits. So, so if, if, if you're interested for this topic, please uh, check out the video from, from uh, Antonio's uh, presentation. That was a really good presentation. Um, Inspire Metadata Profile, we're, we're continuing to, to add uh, uh, improvements on that topic. Uh, the thing is that also the validator uh, is still in a kind of a moving uh, uh, goal that we try to it so so that's uh, we're not finished with the with the metadata profile but uh, we're getting there for example there was an improved uh, anchor support there's a uh, import vocabularies from uh, inspire registry and an uh, option to use a remote validator so you can use the the, the inspire validator to validate uh, metadata records um, this is a, this is a big one so we had quite some discussion on the on the on the uh, mailing list about this topic. So up till 3.8, we have had ISO 19139 as the default uh, schema in, uh, in, in Geo Network. But ISO 19139 is 12 years old now, the latest release. And uh, it's, it's, it's a bit deprecated by ISO itself, but, but in Europe it's still quite common. But we decided to, to remove it. Uh, not remove it, but uh, deprecate it. So, so uh, it's now, uh, not the default schema anymore. It's now ISO 19115-1-3, whatever how you name it. In the workshop, we we de we we suggested to rename these standards and give them real names like tiger and lion because that that talks very much better. Penguin and guinea pig. Um, but uh, for now, we still have this dash one and dash three uh, discussion. So in Geo Network, you have uh, if you install it, you have this schema by default. ISO 19139 will still be available, no problem. If, if that's a relevant standard for you, it's one click to, to uh, um, or it's actually not a click, but you load the templates of the proper schema that you want to have, and it's there. We did some, uh, some uh, patches on the, on the 19139 uh, to, because uh, the ISO TC changed some of their uh, XPaths of uh, XML locations. So now that, that's fine again. Oh, that was it. <laughs> I'm quite fast, no? Thank you. Um, it's really good to see that you're looking at including the new Inspire Validator service. Um, and hopefully that's in soon because otherwise I have to implement something for our, our portal. Um, as part of that, impl of, of being able to call that service from within Geo Network, will you also provide an API? Uh, version so we, we, we could, or our users could call that, that validation through an API? So the ETF validator from Inspire has an API that you can call? Well, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's, there's some discussions and some thoughts about whether our NMA, um, we had a, a service that called the European one and mm. now we're looking to call the new ETF validator. So the, the ETF project itself is also an open source yeah. project. I, yeah. I know the Dutch government implemented, uh, deployed an, their own ETF and, and applied their own rules yeah. in there. That's, so, that's what I've started looking at. But then I yeah. saw that if, if, you, if you guys are going to add that into Geo Network, 
maybe I don't have to do so much. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, and within that API, you, it's expected that metadata is in the catalog. We, you, it, doesn't ex, it doesn't ex accept uh, a remote or a, a raw XML file. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There is, I think there is also a way to provide uh, the XML uh, at the end point, but I'm yeah. not sure how yeah. I can do it. No, I'll, I'll talk more with, yep. with, your, with you as we go. Thank yep. you. More questions? Everybody happy? Okay. Then, thank you, Paul. Look at their booths if you want to talk to them. <laughs>